Good day everyone, welcome to another lecture in the series Medicinal Chemistry 1 and today we'll be speaking mainly about adrenergic agonists. My name is April Johnson. All right, so just to give a general idea of, you know, some of the drugs that you may have heard about and just to make that connection that it's an adrenergic drug, well, albuterol, which is a bronchodilator, and antenolol, which is an antihypertensive drug. And of course, there are many over-the-counter drugs using cold remedies that are adrenergic drugs. Uh, just to point out here that, you know, this is medicinal chemistry. So we look a lot at the functional groups and their associated bioactivity, right? So just to use albuterol as an example, we have a secondary amine here, we have a secondary alcohol, we have the phenolic moiety here, and we have a primary alcohol. So whenever you look at a structure, you always want to look at the functional groups and how they are related to the particular activity. Uh, just to carry along from there, uh, these are some prescription drugs and these are very common and you can go ahead and pick out the ones that jump out uh, to you but just based on the slide that we have just looked at albuterol and you might know it as ventolin the major indication is asthma and the mechanism of action is a beta 2 agonist for atenolol right it has a different mechanism of action it's a beta 1 blocker um, and the major indication is hypertension among other things and one thing that we can uh, observe from this table is that a lot of the major in indication has to do with hypertension even though the mechanism of action varies so an important factor in the response of any cell or organ to adrenergic drugs is the density and proportion of alpha and beta adrenoceptors, right? So for example, norepinephrine has relatively little capacity to increase bronchial airflow because the receptors in the bronchial smooth muscle are largely of the beta 2 subtype. So in contrast to isoproterenol, which is ISO for short, and epinephrine, uh, they are potent bronchodilators. So the important point here, guys, is that we're looking at the density and proportion of alpha and beta adrenoceptors, right? And that is related to, you know, which drugs and their target organs. So it will, it will become a little clearer on this slide, right? So where we see the distribution and effects of adrenoceptors and main uses of the adrenergic drugs, right? So we can see here and, you know, we can pick blood vessel and skin. We can pick CNS. We can pick bronchial smooth muscle since we just mentioned it, right? And for each of these organ or tissue, there's a predominant adrenoceptor, right? So for the blood vessel and skin, that is alpha 1. For the central nervous system, that's alpha 2. For the heart muscle, that's beta 1 mainly. And for the smooth muscle, it's alpha 1 and beta 2, right? So if we go across the table, particularly for the bronchial smooth muscle, since we just mentioned it, um, activation of the alpha one will cause that muscle to contract, while activation of the beta two um, receptor will cause relaxation of that muscle, right? And it should be no surprise here that the therapeutic here therapeutic use here is asthma right so for asthma uh, indication we're looking for beta 2 agonists because it will dilate and open the airways 
as opposed to if alpha one is stimulated then you have closed airways right so this is a very interesting and very important table uh, to link our receptors with what is the effect of the activation and the therapeutic uses and of course you know where are these receptors located so all clinically relevant alpha 1 beta 2 beta 2 1 2 and 3 receptors are postsynaptic receptors and that should mean something to you from the previous lecture that are linked to stimulation of biochemical processes in the postsynaptic cells right so what are these biochemical processes well they lead to all of these things we see here in the table so that leads us now to our first question which is if i wanted my airways to constrict which receptor would need to be stimulated or targeted So if you answered alpha-1 receptor in the bronchial smooth muscle, then you would have had the correct answer. Our follow-up question one says, name two adrenergic prescription drugs, state their mechanism of action as well as their major indication. So go back and just write those things out. All right, so we're gonna go a little bit further into you know the mechanism of action of some of these adrenergic drugs. So here we're looking at drugs affecting adrenergic neurotransmitter, neurotransmission, sorry. And we're gonna start off with drugs affecting catecholamine biosynthesis. And then we're going to look into drugs affecting catecholamine storage and release, right? So the idea here is that we will take a prototypical drug that falls under, you know, the various categories. So we won't be able to go look in detail at every single drug, but the idea here is to take a prototype and then look at that. So the prototype for drugs affecting catechol amine biosynthesis is metyrosine so that is the prototype that we're looking at for this category so although inhibition of any of the three enzymes involved in the catechol amine biosynthesis should decrease in the catechol amines inhibitors of the first and the rate limiting enzyme tyrosine hydroxylase would be most effective. So if we recall the biosynthesis of, you know, dopamine, norepinephrine, and epinephrine, we have four enzymes involved in the biosynthesis. So the point that is being made here is that the first step is the rate limiting step and if you inhibit that enzyme then you will slow down or even stop that process of making or neurotransmitters right so here we're looking at methyrosine so this is the structure of methyrosine and this is the structure of tyrosine right so as we're going to read but as we can look right at the alpha carbon which is right here instead of having a hydrogen as we see in tyrosine we have a methyl and that is why it's called metyrosine so it's a much more effective competitor competitive inhibitor sorry of epinephrine and norepinephrine production than agents that inhibit any of the other enzymes involved in the catechol amine biosynthesis right so it's often possible to fool the enzymes into accepting a structurally similar and unnatural substrate such as methyrosine 
So it differs structurally from tyrosine as we saw already, a hydrogen versus a methyl, and it's one example of a catecholamine biosynthesis inhibitor in clinical use, right? So this is our prototypical drug that we're looking at for drugs affecting catecholamine biosynthesis. So it will, because it looks so similar to tyrosine, it will be a competitive inhibitor and therefore block or inhibit um, catecholamine biosynthesis. So what are some of the drug facts, right? So as we said before, it's used in clinical medicine. Uh, the mechanism of action is that its adrenal medulla, medullary tumors are often benign. Patients frequently suffer hypertensive episodes. Methyrosine reduces the frequency and severity of these episodes by significantly lowering catecholamine production, right? And of course, we know why because it um, inhibits the production. So the active structure, as we see at the top, right, which is here, um, it's used as a racemic mixture. However, only the minus isomer possess inhibitory activity. So as we can see, we have a chiral center here and so basically what they're saying is that they have both isomers uh that is what you would purchase however only one of them has the possess inhibitory activity so for the excretion the drug is polar and excreted mainly unchanged in the urine All right, so now we're going to look at a drug which affects the catecholamine storage and release. So I don't know if you picked this up, but whenever, wherever you see CA, we're talking about catecholamine. And if we don't know what catecholamine is, then we need to check out the previous lecture, right? So uh, reserpine is the drug that we're looking at for the drugs affecting the catecholamine storage and release. So it was isolated in 1952 from the dried root of Rawolfia serpentina, which is Indian snake root, and it was introduced later in 1954. For the mechanism of action here, and as the title suggests, uh, it almost irreversibly blocks the uptake and storage of noradrenaline and dopamine into synaptic vesicles because it inhibits the vesicular monoamine transporters, VMAT for short. So in so doing, it leaves the noradrenaline in the cytoplasm where it is destroyed by MAO, right? So what it does, it blocks the vesicles from storing and therefore it is left, the neurotransmitter is left in the cytoplasm where it is destroyed. And of course, when we talk, when we say destroyed, we mean metabolized, right? And therefore no longer active. So it was once used to treat hypertension. There are several side effects. Um, it is extensively metabolized through hydrolysis of the ester function. So this is the structure here, and I'm sure you're gonna ask me, Miss, do I need to know the structure? No, I don't need you to memorize the structure. But again, you need to be familiar with your functional groups and know how, you know, if you identify a particular functional group, how it will be metabolized. So here, um, it's the hydrolysis of ester, which we have seen before, right? So at position 18, uh, when the ester is hydrolyzed, we're left with an alcohol over here, the acid over here, right? So the alcohol portion 
is the methyl reserpate and the acid portion is the 345 trimethoxy benzoic acid right so just the carboxylic acid here the alcohol here and that is how it is metabolized so that leads us to question two which says which enzyme does methyrosine inhibit and that's A and B says, what are the products of the metabolism of reserpine? So we're going to look at the answer now. So the answer is that it inhibits tyrosine hydroxy and that should have been hydroxylase. And the products of the metabolism of reserpine is the alcohol portion, which is methyl reserpate, and the acid portion, which is 3,4,5-trimethoxybenzoic acid. And our follow-up question two is, compare the structures of methyrosine and tyrosine right so draw both structures and just do a comparison into between both all right so now we're going to look at some sympathomimetic agents right so these are agents which produce effects resembling those produced by stimulation of the sympathetic nervous system and there are various mechanisms of action and we're going to look at direct indirect as well as mixed All right, so what are these, you may ask? So for the direct acting agents, they elicit a sympathomimetic response by interacting directly with adrenergic receptors. So as the name suggests, for indirect acting agents, they produce effects primarily by causing the release of norepinephrine from adrenergic nerve terminals so the norepinephrine that is released by the indirect acting agent activates the receptors to produce the response right so that is how the indirect acting agents work while the third category is the compounds with a mixed mechanism of action and it interacts directly with adrenergic receptors and indirectly to cause the release of norepinephrine, right? So they do both and and hence the and hence why it's called mixed. All right, so for the direct acting sympathomimetics, we're going to look briefly at the endogenous catechol amines, and we're already familiar with them. Uh, the dual alpha and beta agonists slash antagonist, and or alpha adrenergic agonist, as well as or beta adrenergic agonist. So as I said before, yes, we're looking at our endogenous catechol endogenous sorry catechol amines but we're also looking at you know just a prototypical drug from the other areas so here i mean by now we're familiar with structure activity relationships right so for and that's basically what we're going to go into right now for our direct acting sympathomimetics, right? So the manner in which beta phenyl ethyl amine is substituted on the meta and para positions of the aromatic ring on the amino, which we're calling R1 here, and on the alpha carbon and the substituent here we're calling R2, and the beta, which is here, the beta position of the ethyl amine side chain influences 
their mechanism of action, the receptor selectivity, their absorption, their oral activity, their metabolism, their degradation, and thus their duration of action, right? So this is a real hardcore structure activity relationship now. Um, when we vary all of these things which we mentioned here, it affects all of these things, right? And just to mention that the structure that is required for activity, these are the three main things. So we need uh, one R. So we need, this is a chiral center and we need the configuration here to be R with respect to its substituents. And we need the catechol ring. And we also need a beta so this is the beta position so this is alpha to the amine alpha to the amine beta to the amine so the phenyl is attached at the beta position which is why it's a beta phenyl and this is ethyl so there are two carbons that separate them ethyl amine right so that is the structure required for the activity so now we're going to look at you know, if you vary any of these things, uh, what is the effect on the activity? All right, so maximal activity is seen when on the ethyl amine portion of the beta phenyl ethyl amine molecule, there is a catechol group as well as a 1ROH group, which we mentioned already, right? So we're repeating here the essentials for the activity. So such structural features are seen in the prototypical direct, direct acting compounds, which, is, which are our endogenous compounds, right? As well as ISO. And we're looking here at the model of beta-2 adrenergic receptors binding studies, right? And here we're looking, and clearly it's a prototypical um, drug, right? In the sense that it has a catechol portion and they, there is hydrogen bonding, right? Which is why those this catechol ring is important. Um, for the hydroxyl group, there you know we have hydrogen bonding interaction occurring here there is hydrophobic interaction and we also have anionic and cationic interaction occurring at the amine portion right so clearly it is protonated the amine is protonated and therefore it's able to have this interaction in the receptor right so this uh further strengthens the whole point of what are the essentials for the activity because we're able to see here where um it binds to particular parts of the receptor all right so the second thing that we're looking at is optical activity so a critical factor in the interaction of the adrenergic agonists with their receptors is stereoselectivity so substitution on either carbon one or carbon two yields to optical isomers. So carbon one here and carbon two we're labeling that as uh, or beta and alpha carbon. Any, any substitution that you have occurring there leads to a chiral center, right? And once you have chiral center, then you have optical isomers. So the 1R2S isomer seem correct, um, seem to be the correct configuration for direct acting activity, right? So 1R, so R at this side, this chiral center, and S at this chiral center seem to be what helps direct acting activity. 
So for catechol amines, the more potent enantiomer is the 1R configuration, and that should make sense to us because all of our endogenous um, neurotransmitters are of the R configuration. So this enantiomer is typically several, in fact, 100 fold times more potent than the 1S configuration, right? So the, the second thing that is important, <clears throat> we have our catechol ring and our 1S, 1R, sorry, 2S uh, configuration is important for activity as well. So next we're looking at the separation of aromatic ring and amino group, right? So by far the greatest adrenergic activity occurs when two carbon atoms separate the aromatic ring from the amino group as we have seen, right? So we have the aromatic ring here, the amino group, two carbons, and that has been the greatest adrenergic activity. So this rule applies with few exceptions to all types of activities, right? So that's important. So <clears throat> the R1, which is here, right? So the group that is attached to the nitrogen here, substitution on the amino nitrogen determines alpha or beta receptor selectivity, right? So the amine is normally ionized at physiological pH, which we saw when we looked at the um, binding receptor. If we look at that quickly again, we saw where it's ionized, right? And this is important for direct agonist activity because replacing nitrogen with carbon results in a large decline in activity. So if we replace nitrogen with carbon, then there's a large decline in activity. The activity is also affected by the number of substituents on the nitrogen, right? So primary and secondary amines have good adrenergic activity. However, when we look at tertiary amines and quaternary ammonium salts, they do not, right? So essentially, we want this amine to be either a primary or a secondary amine for good adrenergic activity. All right, so now we're looking on, well, further looking at the selectivity portion. So the nature of that amino substituent also dramatically affects the receptor selectivity of the compound, right? So what's important here is that as the size of the nitrogen substituent increases, right, alpha receptor agonist activity generally decreases while the beta receptor agonist activity increases, right? So let me repeat that. As the size, as we, as we get bulkier in terms of the group that's attached to the nitrogen, Alpha receptor agonist activity decreases, beta receptor agonist activity increases, right? Thus, norepinephrine is more, has more um, alpha activity, right? So let's look at, you know, we're going across here and we're getting bulkier and bulkier, right? So we have hydrogen compared to methyl compared to um isopropyl compared to butyl right bulkier so as no so norepinephrine which is here has more alpha activity than beta activity and epinephrine which is here is a potent agonist at alpha, beta 1, and beta 2 receptors. However, isoproterenol is a potent beta 1 and beta 2 agonist, but it has little affinity for alpha receptors, right? So the key point here is that as we get bulkier, we have more beta receptor agonist activity, like that increases, right? So here we have 
alpha agonist, um, somewhat non-selective, and as you get bulkier, we have beta 1 and beta 2 agonist, non-selective beta agonist, and then as we get bulkier here, we have selective beta 2 agonist, right? So clearly, the effect of the group or the size of the group affects the receptor alpha or beta receptor selectivity and in addition to that these results indicate that the beta receptor has a larger lipophilic binding pocket adjacent to the amine binding aspartic acid residue that than do the alpha receptors, right? So what they have found is that when you actually increase the length of the alkyl chain, it actually offers no advantage. But if you add a polar functional group at the end of the alkyl group, the situation changes. So let's have a look at this compound here, right? So here we have our amine, and this is a long portion of hydrophobic region, right? However, they have this polar group at the end here, which where which is labeled extra binding interaction. So that actually impacts the activity or changes the situation, as we said before. So adding a phenol group to the end of a C2 alkyl chain results in a dramatic rise in activity, indicating that there's an extra polar binding region which has been accessed, which can take part in hydrogen bonding, as we see, um, you know, as we saw rather in the when we looked at the model drug receptor interaction we saw a lot of hydrogen bonding so clearly somewhere was accessed that we're able to know have hydrogen bonding so experiments have shown that the activity of the extension analog is thereby increased by a whopping factor of 800 right that's huge So now we're looking at R2 substitution. So substitution uh, on the alpha carbon, which is carbon 2, right? This carbon right here. So addition of small alkyl groups such as methyl increases the resistance to metabolism and lipophilicity. So such compounds often exhibit enhanced oral effectiveness and greater CNS activity than their counterparts that do not contain an alpha alkyl group, right? And that should make sense to you at this point if it um, increases lipophilicity. So compounds with an alpha methyl substituent persist in the nerve terminals and are more likely to release norepinephrine from storage sites, right? So you can have either methyl or ethyl substitution on the alpha carbon of the ethyl amine side chain uh, reduces direct agonist activity at both alpha and beta receptors, right? So this methyl norepinephrine here is an active isomer and it's a selective alpha-2 agonist. All right, so continuing our structure activity relationships here, we're looking at the hydroxyl substitution on the beta carbon which is carbon one so it generally decreases cns activity largely because it lowers lipid solubility that is the hydroxyl right 
So substitution enhances agonist activity at both alpha and beta receptors, right? So for example, ephedrine, which we will meet in a little, is less potent than methamphetamine as a central stimulant, but is more powerful in dilating bronchioles and increasing blood pressure and heart rate right so we're looking at let's look at the structures here so in one case we have our hydroxyl group in the form of ephedrine and for the methamphetamine there is no hydroxyl here right so the effect of that is that ephedrine is less potent than methamphetamine as a central stimulant but is more powerful in dilating bronchioles and increasing blood pressure and heart rate and right so that is therefore because it is ephedrine is less lipophilic and therefore consequently less cns activity and it has more alpha and beta activity while methamphetamine it has less alpha and beta activity however it's more lipophilic and therefore more has more cns activity so compounds lacking this beta hydroxyl group um, have greatly reduced adrenergic receptor activity and some of the activity is retained indicating that the hydroxyl group is important but not essential right so let me just repeat that so earlier we said that the hydroxyl hydroxyl group is essential for activity so in the absence of the hydroxyl group they we still have some amount of activity um you know however the let me repeat myself so some of the activity is retained indicating that the hydroxyl group is important but not essential right so in the absence of it some of the activity is retained so yes um it is important but not essential right i hope that's clear so the r enantiomer of norepinephrine is more active than the s enantiomer as we have stated before indicating that the secondary alcohol is involved in a hydrogen bonding interaction right so clearly there is something going on with our hydroxyl group and the receptor some hydrogen bonding interaction which when we replace it with the S in antiomer, um, it's not able to carry out that hydrogen bonding and therefore not able to have um, similar activity, right? So the important point here is that the hydroxyl group is important but not essential. So let's look at the substitution on the aromatic ring. So maximal alpha and beta activity also depends on the presence of the 3,4 um, hydroxyl group, right? That is the, um, the catechol unit. So tyramine, uh, which lacks two, the two hydroxyl groups, has no affinity for adrenal receptors indicating the importance of the hydroxyl groups, right? So here, uh, we're seeing here that if you take off one of the hydroxyl group, which is the case with tyramine, then it will have no affinity for adrenal receptors. How about substitution on the aromatic ring so although the catechol moiety is important as we said before several times in terms of yielding compounds with the maximal agonist activity another thing i want to say here guys is that a lot of the times when well earlier when i mentioned that these particular structural features are essential for activity it doesn't mean that if it doesn't have a particular functional group it won't have activity 
it probably means that the activity will be significantly reduced, right? So notice the term here, maximal for the catechol uh, moiety, once you have that, uh, there is maximal agonist activity at adrenal septus, right? So it can be replaced with other substituted phenyl moieties to provide selective adrenergic agonists, right? So let's have a look at some of these below. So just to mention that this basic unit is called resorcinol. That is when you have the hydroxyl groups meta to each other, right? As we see here in metaproteranol, right? So let's start off with phenyl ephrin. And it has less alpha and beta activity than norepinephrine. It is a selective alpha-1 agonist, almost no beta activity, right? So it only has the hydroxyl group here. So clearly this hydroxyl group is involved in some amount of um, receptor bind, hydrogen bonding with the receptor. And for metaproteranol, right, we have the hydroxyls um, arranged in a meta, meta to each other. And then we have a similar um, portion here where we have the amine, we have our ethyl, and we have our hydroxyl. So the only difference in comparison to what we have looked at so far is that the hydroxyls are meta to each other. So what does that cause? Well, it's a selective beta 2 agonist, right? However, it's not metabolized by come to better absorption and longer duration of action. So this error means that because it's not metabolized by come, then you have better, well, you have longer duration of action, definitely. And you have better absorption um, here. So it is also a selective beta 2 agonist. So for albuterol, um, similar structure on this end. However, instead of having the hydroxyl here, there's a methylene connected to the hydroxyl. And this also is a selective beta 2 agonist. Um, and it's also not met metabolized by COMT and therefore it has better oral bioavailability, right? So important point here is that yes, we need that catechol moiety. However, there are exceptions to that rule where you have the hydroxyl group, you know, either one and located here or, you know, one of them has been moved and they still maintain their agonist activity. So just in case, you know, you might be wondering, what is COMT again, right? So COMT is catechol O-methyl transferase and it uh, catecholizes the last step of the metabolism, right? So from here to here, it's methylate, the intermediate here, and it's the last step of the metabolism in which um, the structure is then, or the compound is then excreted. All right, so what about directing actin agents without the OH groups, right? So we mentioned methamphetamine earlier or um, amphetamine. Well, fethyl ethyl amines that lack the OH or hydroxyl group on the ring and the beta um, hydroxyl group on the side chain act almost exclusively by causing the release of norepinephrine from the synaptic nerve terminals and thus result in a loss of direct sympathomimetic activity, right? 
So we look at this further when we um, study the indirect acting drugs, right? So because substitution of the hydroxyl group on the phenyl ethyl amine structure makes the resultant compound less um, lipophilic, unsubstituted and alkyl substituted compounds cross the um, blood-brain barrier more readily and have more CNS activity. So clearly, um, these compounds are more lipophilic, right? And therefore, because of that, they can cross the blood-brain barrier and therefore will have considerable CNS activity so generally speaking now for classical amines and when we look at their routes of administration or duration of action which is roa doa for short um the classical amines um per oral have only a brief duration of action and are almost inactive because they're rapidly inactivated um you know because of the metabolism that we mentioned earlier so in contrast compounds without one or both phenol phenolic oid substituents are however not metabolized by count and they're orally active and have longer duration of action so this is a a slide which basically summarizes the entire um, structure activity relationship of direct acting sympathomimetics, right? So it goes through systemically um, everything that we just spoke about earlier. So this is a good uh, slide just to keep even by itself to look back at and uh, you know, just to help you to understand what it's saying. When the arrow is pointing up, it's increasing beta active. So for example, um, for R1 here, substitution on the nitrogen, um, the increases the size, uh, if you increase the size of R1, then you have increased beta activity, decrease of activity. So the, the, Tert butyl group has you know increased beta 2 activity and you have decreased degradation by MAO, right? So that's how you read through all of this information here. So that leads us now to question three, which says design an adrenergic receptor agonist based on all of the information that you have just been privy to and discuss the activity. So uh, what I have, this is the compound that I have designed. I have no idea if it exists or not, right? So I have my catechol um, unit, I have my hydroxyl, I have my amine, and I have two carbons between my aromatic group and my nitrogen. So I have my catechol moiety, which means, so let's look at the question again. It says design it and discuss the activity. So this is my design and this is my activity. <laughs> So because it has a catechol moiety, it means therefore that it is metabolized by COMT and therefore I have a short duration of action or will have a short duration of action and therefore poor oral activity. I do expect both alpha and beta agonist activity by virtue of, you know, the structure and it is hydrophilic. You know, we have four, three hydroxyl groups, so we, I expect poor CNS activity, so I don't expect it to cross the blood-brain barrier, right? I have a 1-SOH isomer, that is the hydroxyl group here, so um, I, the 1-ROH is required for activity, meaning that we need the hydroxyl group to be in the R for 
our configuration for maximal activity. Um, it's a beta phenyl ethylamine. However, tertiary amines do not have good activity, right? So I have a tertiary amine here and they do not have good activity. So clearly, I have designed a drug which may have a bit of alpha beta agonist activity. However, maybe a little, um, it, it wouldn't be the best drug that we have seen right but the idea of this exercise here is is to um walk you through a question like that how you're expected to um answer that type of question so the follow-up question three says this and i'm sure this is no surprise design your own adrenergic receptor agonist so it cannot be any established drug it has to be your own and tell me about the activity so um aim for better activity than mine though all right so it has to be something that we haven't discussed so far and it also has to be much better than mine in terms of the activity all right, so having gone through the structure activity relationships, right, I want to take some time to look at some examples of these agents, right? So we're not going to spend a lot of time. We're going to just go through some uh, prototypical um, drugs in these various categories. So we're going to look at our endogenous catechol amines, um, et cetera. All right, so let's look at our endogenous catechol amines. So dopamine, um, I, by this stage, guys, you, looking at the structure should be like, oh, okay, right? It's a, is a catechol we know about that we know that's a primary amine we know it will be rapidly metabolized by compton mao and it therefore will have a short duration of action no oral activity so by this point you should be able to look at that structure and derive all of this information activity information here so because it has no oral activity it's used intravenously in treatment of shock um, in contrast to um, the others you know nep um, epinephrine or norepinephrine dopamine increases blood flow to the kidney in doses that have no effect on the heart etc the increased blood flow to the kidneys enhances filtration etc right so for norepinephrine like dopamine it is polar rapidly metabolized by both compt and mao um poor oral bioavailability short duration of action and you're given a time there one to two minutes even when even when given intravenously and you might know that it's a stimulant of you know various alpha and beta 1 receptor and it lacks the n methyl group which results in lacking beta 2 and beta 3 activity right and it is used to counteract various hypotensive crises it has limited clinical application caused by non-selective nature of its activities and for epinephrine right and it's easily like the others easily oxidized on exposure to air because of the catechol ring system and there are various ways in which um to minimize the oxidation so they create solutions by adding sodium bisulfite in order to increase the stability of epinephrine 
Epinephrine is also destroyed readily in alkaline solutions and by metals and weak oxidizing agents. So it is used in aqueous solution for inhalation as the free amine. And again, like other amines, it forms salts, or even as we saw in the model receptor, it forms salts with acids, hydrochloride, and the bitartrate being the most common, and which is why I have a structure here of the bitartrate salt. So like the others it lacks oral activity short duration of action much more widely used clinically than norepinephrine it's a potent stimulant of all of the adrenal receptors and thus it switches on all possible adrenal receptors leading to a whole range of desired and side effects right so can you imagine taking epinephrine here? All of your adrenal receptors are stimulated. So you're getting the desired effect, but you're getting a whole, um, a, a lot of side effects. And just to mention the whole side effects issue here, that, you know, that is how most of your drugs end up with side effects because not be because we have seen, you know, that, a receptor isn't only in a particular area, right? So it is located at other sites, right? And that is how we end up with side effects. Well, part of the reason why we end up with other side effects. So particular prominence are the actions on the heart and on vascular and other smooth muscle. It's a very potent um, vasoconstrictor and cardiac stimulant. In general, it has greater beta activity caused by the N-methyl group, right? So it has the N-methyl group here. And it therefore used to stimulate the heart in cardiac arrest, right? And plus a plethora of other uses, uses sorry, uh, related to it being a stimulant of the beta-2 receptor as well. So now we're looking at dual alpha and beta agonist slash antagonist. So the example that we're using, our prototypical example here is our um, dobutamine, the butamine. So here we see where it's a positive ionotropic agent administered intravenously for congestive heart failure. So an inotrope, as I have here, is an agent that alters the force or energy of muscular contractions. So it's either negative or positive. When it's negative, it weakens the force of muscular contraction. When it's positive, it increases the strength of the muscular contraction. So the fact that uh, dobutamine is um, positive means that it increases the strength of muscular contraction. So as you can see, it definitely resembles dopamine. Uh, just looking at the structure here, right? Um, it possesses a center of asymmetry and both enantiomeric forms are present in the racemic mixture used clinically, right? So clearly we have a chiral center here and what's interesting here is that the minus isomer is a potent alpha one agonist while the the plus isomer is a potent alpha one antagonist which blocks the effects of the other one right so they basically cancel out because the fact that we the the mixture that is available clinically is a racemic one it means that you have equal amounts of the plus and minus isomer and they literally cancel out each other on in terms of the activity on the alpha one uh, receptor however the effects of these two isomers are mediated by a beta one receptors 
So both isomers actually appear to be full agonists. Right, but the the plus isomer is more potent um, than the minus isomer, approximately tenfold. Right, so the good thing here is that for the beta one receptors, both of them are agonists, and one is more potent than the other. So here, as I said before, a dual. So it both has alpha and beta agonist and antagonist activity, right? So the prototypical drug, dobutamine that we're looking at here. So that leads us now to our question four, which says, draw the structure of norepinephrine and explain why it's lacking in beta two and beta three activity. Now, so that is a structure, right? That's the structure of norepinephrine. And the reason why it has little to no beta 2 or beta 3 activity is because it lacks functionality or an alkyl group on the amine portion, right? So as we saw previously, as we have increased or have more or even the bulkiness of the alkyl group is increased then we have more beta activity here we have no um, methyl or tert butyl group so therefore we have little to no beta 2 beta 3 activity our follow-up question four says discuss the structure of dobutamine in light of its activity against alpha and beta adrenergic receptors. So just draw the structure and discuss it. Um, discuss the, the chiral center and just talk about its activity against both the alpha and beta adrenergic receptors. All right, so now we're going to look at an example of the alpha adrenergic receptor agonist. And here, uh, we're looking at these examples here. So they are all selective alpha-1 agonists and they have therapeutic activity as um, vasoconstrictors. And structurally, they include phenyl ethanolamines and such as phenyl phenylephrine which we met already and some others right so what you want to do here is to just look at the structure right and relate it to the activity uh, towards the alpha 1 agonist right so what are the similarities between the structures here and which will give some insights into what is important for alpha-1 activity. Why are they selective towards um, alpha-1 adrenal receptors, right? So here we have our benzene group presenting all. All have the, um, as we said before, ethanol, phenyl ethanol, sorry, phenyl ethanol amines, right? So they have the ethanol portion, this here, ethanol amine, so phenyl ethanol amine, right? So all have phenyl ethanol, so two carbons and an OH, ethanol amine, right? That is a similarity between all three and pretty much everything else varies, right? So that gives us insight into what is required or necessary for the alpha-1 agonist activity. So let's take a look at this one, right? This, this group of compounds also have selective alpha-1 activity agonist activity but structurally they're definitely not related to the group that we just saw on the previous slide right these are two aryl imidazole 
imid azolines, right? And this is the structure, right? So we have our imidazole ring and at position two, we have an aryl group. So these are the various one, two, and our aryl group here. So our imidazole moiety, that's spelled wrong, PKA nine to 10, limited access to the CNS, right? So the point we're making on this slide, and as you can see, it's uh, two, all of them are two aryl imidazole derivatives, right? And so that's why for the most part, they end when we end with azoline, right? So these are things that you need to bear in mind when you're trying to recall um, a particular class of compounds, right? So the end of the name are, well, in this case, they're similar, all right? So the point we're making on this slide is that, yes, it's different. Like the previous slide, they also had selective alpha-1 agonists. However, um, this structure this is it's different right and it has the same activity all right so these are selective alpha 2 agonists right and so clearly again different structures and we have various names and various structures right so if we look at clonidine one of the metabolites of clonidine is 4-hydroxyclonidine, which is when R here is the hydroxyl group. It has good affinity for the alpha-2 receptors, but because it is too polar to get into the CNS, it is not an effective antihypertensive agent, right? So the metabolite here is too polar, so no passage into the CNS. And... However, for clonidine, there is some passage, passage sorry, into CNS because R here is H, right? So we have our guanidine group and uh, that gives rise to, in association with the other features, alpha-2 agonist activity. So here we just want to look at the various structures and functional groups and to see, okay, well, this one penetrates the CNS, this one also penetrates the CNS, and our metabolite here, however, was not able to, to pass the CNS. And even when you change the R group to an amine, right, no passage into CNS. So here, you know, these are cyclic, cyclic, sorry, structures on this end, while we have the open ring imidazolines, right, which are here, right? So open ring of the above, right? And they also have selective alpha-2 activity. So clearly the ring, is not essential for it to be a, have selective alpha-2 agonist activity because the open ring version also has activity. All right, so now we're going to look at beta adrenergic receptor agonist. And we have seen, I think we've seen most if not all of them already. So here on one slide, we have the non-selective beta-1, beta-2 in the form of isoproteranol, which we have seen several times before. And then we also have the beta-2 selective uh, drugs here, right? So all of these are beta-2 selective and we, we saw them already. Well, we met some of them when we were doing the structure activity relationships and as we can see here you know we have this bulky group this bulky group um whether it be the isopropyl or the tert butyl 
um, that is definitely a requirement for selective beta 2 activity. So, I mean, we already discussed at length the requirements for beta 2 selective activity. So, at this point, we're just giving some examples of various drugs that fall in this category. And, of course, looking at their structures, which we kind of looked at already. All right, so now we're looking at indirect acting sympathomimetics. So what are these? These indirect acting sympathomimetics, they act by releasing endogenous norepinephrine, right? So they also enter the nerve ending by way of the active uptake process and displace norepinephrine from its storage granules, right? And so, as with direct acting agents, the presence of the catechol groups enhances the potency of indirect acting phenyl ethyl amines, right? So, again, they act by releasing endogenous norepinephrine. So, if we follow here, and we already looked at the structure of um, tyramine, um, so we can see here that, you know, it's an active uptake process. It enters the nerve ending and it displaces or norepinephrine, right? Right? Okay, all right. So it enters the cell and it causes norepinephrine to be released, which then stimulates the adrenergic receptors. So the indirect acting drugs that are used therapeutically are not catechol derivatives and in most cases do not even contain the hydroxyl moiety, right? So the presence of a beta hydroxyl group decreases and an alpha methyl group increases the effectiveness of indirect acting agents. And so the presence of nitrogen substituents decreases indirect activity with substituents larger than methyl groups, rendering the compound virtually inactive. So phenyl ethyl amines that contain a tertiary amino group are also ineffective as uh, norepinephrine releasing agents. So these are or indirect acting, they cause release of norepinephrine. So two examples here, um, amphetamine and p-tyramine are often cited as prototypical indirect acting sympathomimetics. All right, so the final group that we're looking at is sympathomimetic mixed mechanism of action, right? So here we're looking at um, direct and indirect activity. So the first drug that we're looking at is ephedrine. So this drug is an alkaloid that can be obtained from the stems of various species of ephedra. The plant containing ephedrine was known to the Chinese in 2000 BC, but the active principle ephedrine was not isolated until 1885. In recent years, various companies have begun marketing extracts of the shrub for purposes such as weight loss and enhancement of athletic performance and didn't mention but that is a picture right what we're seeing here a picture of the actual plant so this is a structure of ephedrine right and it has mixed mechanism of action and so it has one r here two s configuration 
and clearly because it has two chiral centers means it has two to the two um to the power of two um isomers right so if we have two chiral center then we'll have four isomers so we have the enantiomers and we have some diastereomers right so we know that the enantiomers are mirror images and the diastereomers are not mirror images right so however the 1r2s configuration is the one that is that we're talking about that is branded ephedrine and has a mixed mechanism of action so it has direct activity on alpha and beta some indirect activity the most active of the four isomers as a presser amine right so the others you know we have have mixed mechanism of action the enantiomer also has a mixed mechanism of action but primarily indirect activity um and for this isomer it has virtually no direct activity mostly indirect activity right so um all of the isomers have a mixed mechanism of action and some more direct than indirect and vice versa so for the pharmacological activity of the 1r2s ephedrine um clearly it rem it resembles epinephrine and it acts on both alpha and beta receptors its ability to activate beta receptors probably accounted for its earlier use in asthma right and we should know why so it is the classic example of a sympathomimetic with a mixed mechanism of action again as we said we're taking the prototypical drug well that can be considered as a prototypical drug in a particular category just to walk through it and to explain how they work so lacking hydrogen bond in phenolic groups right so there's no hydroxyl group here it's less polar and thus crosses the blood brain barrier far better than other catechol amines for obvious reasons right and so it therefore has been used as a cns stimulant and exhibits side effects related to its action in the brain it causes more pronounced stimulation of the CNS than epinephrine, which should make sense at this point. So this also should make sense. Um, it's not metabolized by either MAO or COMT and therefore has more oral activity and a longer duration of action than epinephrine. And like many other phenyl isopropyl amines, a significant fraction of the drug is excreted unchanged in the urine, although it can be P hydroxylated. So that's here, if we add an OH group here. And ND methylated, that is remove the methyl group here by cytochrome P450 mixed function oxidases. So because it's a wheat base, its excretion can be accelerated by acidification of the urine. So ephedrine and its salts are used. They are used orally. So, you know, all of the uses, and I hope you guys are watching and listening to these examples uh, to have an idea of how the structure is related to the activity and not only that related to the route of administration right so for various conditions which I'm not going to name but it's here All right, so our final question is, how many chiral centers does ephedrine possess? And then part B says, how is ephedrine metabolized? 
So the answer to that is we have two chiral centers, right? So if we remember our formula from earlier chemistry, if we have two chiral centers, then the formula is two to the n so n is the number of chiral centers so that's two squared in this case so we have four stereoisomers for b a significant fraction of the drug is excreted unchanged as we said previously however if it is changed it is p the possibilities are p hydroxylation here as well as nd cutting off the methyl group here by um a cytochrome p for 450 enzyme our follow-up question five says design an indirect acting sympathomimetic drug right so based on the prototype that we have seen are you able to now design an indirect acting sympathomimetic drug so that is the end of it if you made it to the end thank you so much for watching and see you next time